Makahanya Haramita Shingyo Ganji Zai Boza Gyojananya Haramita Jishokengo Gai Gudo Sai Guyakusha Picture number 10 Entering the marketplace with bliss bestowing hands. The brushwood gate is firmly shut, and neither sage nor Buddha can see him. He has deeply buried his light, and permits himself to differ from the well-established ways of the old masters. Carrying a gourd, he enters the market. Twirling his staff, he returns home. He frequents wine shops and fish stalls to make the drunkards open their eyes, and to awaken to themselves. So now we come to the last picture in our series of the ten bull herding pictures and uh, this is the conclusion of our journey. If we look at our picture we see two figures again. On the left we have uh, a rather larger than life figure looking perhaps somewhat like the classic Hote or otherwise commonly known as the Laughing Buddha um, with his robe wide open, his belly hanging out, he's got a beard and hair, he, he carries in both hands on his right hand he has a staff and attached to that staff there is a, a huge swag bag that uh, hangs down the back there and in his left he holds a little wicker basket with the top firmly on it and this he holds out towards the second figure smiling and laughing in the second figure uh, we have someone who looks not dissimilar to our herdsman right back from the very beginning uh, there he is somewhat smaller slightly hunched over also carrying a staff he's traveling too and he has a little bundle attached to his staff and we notice that in comparison to the uh, great bodhisattva on the left uh, this little bundle is is very tidy and in fact if we remember now in that first picture the herdsman didn't have any bundle at all so the suggestion may well be that this bundle actually has to be laid down and um, so there's a connecting up now with that first picture we've traveled all the way through from one to ten and is always as is often the case in, in Buddhism, uh, things tie up in a cyclical fashion and uh, uh, these bullheading pictures are, are no different either. Here we are in the heart of the Mahayana and uh, it's said that uh, uh, Buddhas have something to teach and we have something to hear uh, and something to put into practice. And so there is a sense of continuation and continuity here. Um, when we start in this practice or when we embark upon the bodhisattva path, uh, because we are somewhat self-obsessed, we tend to think mainly of our own uh, training. Uh, and, and we see ourselves and our training somewhat in isolation, I think. Uh, that some we, we have an aim in mind, Satori or Kensho, uh, enlightenment, call it what we like. Um, and then after that, well, we don't really think very much because this is what we're trying to attain. We're quite sort of goal-oriented. And in Buddhism, everything is part of this process of just ongoing process of coming to be and ceasing to be. This is the nature of the world in which we live and our tiny lives are a part of that process. We are, uh, uh, we are threads uh, within that wo uh, woven fabric, but only threads, but yet that fabric is made up of those threads. Um, and so uh, this great bodhisattva has that sense of that continuity, that sense of lineage, what's known in Sanskrit, uh, in Indian Mahayana Buddhism as the Gotra, this is the uh, lineage from which we come from. And when in the early text, when the Buddha used to refer to uh, uh, OU of noble families, um, he wasn't referring to the fact that some that people he was talking to, to were aristocrats or something like that. Uh, what he was referring to was the fact that uh, because these people could hear 
uh, what the Buddha was saying because they were moved to listen to the Buddha. Uh, therefore, their consciousness, their heart, um, already had seeds of awakening within it um, and that those seeds are active uh, and that they are producing the consciousness that is just now listening to the Dharma. Um, it's said in the old teachings that there were four things necessary in order to uh, walk the path and, th and that was first of all to be born at a time uh, when the Buddha Dharma exists, uh, to be born in a place where it's present and where it's being spread uh, because even if we lived 500 years ago if we were in Europe we would never have heard of the Buddha Dharma. To come into contact with uh, the Buddha Dharma uh, and finally for our heart to be moved uh, to practice the Buddha Dharma. And so these four conditions uh, very much not only take into account the external conditions uh, necessary, obviously being born at a time and a, at a place uh, where the Dharma is available, but also the inner conditions as well. Um, this is part of what uh, Master Confucius uh, taught as well when he said uh, that about those inner conditions that it's well he described a scene where something happened and three people witnessed it and one burst out laughing the second one burst into tears uh, and the third one walked right past it didn't even notice it was happening it just didn't interest him at all didn't impact on his consciousness so Always with all situations, we are taking into account the outer situation and the inner situation. In our training, this is exactly the same too. Quite often, people uh, in the training, uh, we get very lost in, in the outer circumstances, uh, particularly when the passions are involved. And of course, in, in the Buddha Dharma, uh, what we're interested in are those inner reactions. So. Uh, yes, it may well be that at work my boss doesn't appreciate uh, uh, the work that I do. Uh, that's just a fact, and uh, uh, that's how it is. And there are certain things that we may do as a result of that. Uh, but as well as that, there's also an inner reaction. How is it that, that I actually react to the fact of not being appreciated? Now, and in Buddhism, that's what we work with. The outer circumstances... Well, they have their own ways of being dealt with. Um, uh, but Buddhism uh, is concerned with that inner reaction, the how, the how the heart reacts, because we are always seeking to uh, uh, develop insight into our own nature, into our own heart nature uh, as well. And our heart plays itself out within the circumstances that we encounter every day. This is why in, those, in one of the earlier uh, uh, bullherding pictures, uh, when the herdsman first comes upon the bull, uh, it says that now where, wherever he looks about, uh, the herdsman sees his own heart, nothing but his own heart. Uh, it disports itself in, in all the circumstances uh, of his life. Uh, and this is what we discover as we continue our practice. So... These are our two characters now. Uh, just looking a little bit more at uh, the Bodhisattva, what can we say about him? Well, if we think that actually he's supposed to be a monk, uh, and we can see that he doesn't look very monk-like. Uh, for a start, a Buddhist monk, you don't expect to have beards and uh, hair on the head. Normally that's clean-shaven. And uh, yet here he is with it. He's differed from the ways. Um, also, we see that uh, his robe is quite open. He's not modestly dressed. We normally expect a monk or a nun to be modest in their behavior. Uh, that's part of the rule. And yet here he, he is quite wide open and his belly's hanging out. And we have to remember that um, actually the old uh, folk tales in China and Japan, uh, uh, used particularly with the little boys, uh, who were expected to wear the kumabuns that go round the middle, uh, and they were told that if they didn't, then the thunder god would come down and steal their navels. One of those classic uh, stories that are used to get little boys to behave, and uh, that's drilled into them from a young age, uh, and the idea being that. Uh, 
such a one will be fearful now of exposing his navel in public. But look here. Actually what is being shown here is complete fearlessness. Uh, the liberation from uh, all those fears uh, that I have. And so he can go about literally with liver, spleen, heart, lungs, intestines all hanging out. Uh, he's quite unafraid and his face is a, a picture of a joy. Uh, he's laughing and smiling as well. So now let's ha just turn and have a look uh, at our verse. The brushwood gate is firmly shut and neither sage nor Buddha can see him. What is that brushwood gate? This is the the gate to that deep mystery, what's referred to as the gateless gate. Uh, it's that innermost sanctuary, innermost place within the heart uh, that contains at its very core a mystery. And the idea of mystery and the uh, uh, playing out of mystery and the presence of mystery is, is central to all religions and all religions have it. Um, I remember when I was being brought up, uh, I was brought up Catholic and uh, at the, behind the altar uh, there was the, the tabernacle and inside the tabernacle uh, was the host uh, which was believed to be the transubstantiated uh, uh, matter of bread into the body of Christ which was the most sacred thing. Uh, no one could touch that except the priest and most of the time it was hidden away in that tabernacle and was only brought out uh, for communion. It was kept locked away. Uh, again that sense of that innermost sanctuary. Same was also the case uh, for example in Jerusalem when uh, uh, Solomon built the temple. Uh, there was also an inner sanctuary where only the pre high priests could go. Uh, everyone else used to worship from outside and in fact in the pagan world this was also the same uh, in many temples too. Uh, that the deity would live within the image, within the statue, within the temple but nobody could go into the temple or and certainly not into the inner sanctuary. Only the high priest or high priestess was able to do that. Uh, everyone else had to stand outside and the rituals and rites would take place often out in the open um, in front of the temple. Uh, the same is also true in in certain temples in Japan. Uh, I can think of one uh, that has a medicine Buddha uh, that according to the foundation story of that particular temple uh, was washed up on a shore a thousand years ago or near coming up to a thousand years ago uh, and that that statue still exists uh, but it is housed within a, uh, a shrine uh, and again that shrine is always locked and only the high priest, the chief priest, can unlock and, and open it and, and view it. No one else is allowed to do so. There are replicas of it, but the original, that is kept under lock and key. And this, this sense of there, there being a secret at the heart of something, a, a, a real mystery, uh, is central in religion. And Buddhism is, is no different either. And when we look at this picture, uh, where do we see that mystery? Well, there is that little wicker basket that's being held in the uh, uh, great Bodhisattva's left hand. He holds it out and shows uh, the, the aspirant this mystery because this is something that's revealed. And I think for, for most people who um, have a sort of religious or spiritual bent, there is this sense of a mystery. Something moves us. We read something, maybe the enigmatic sayings. Uh, Maybe it's uh, something scriptural, but, but something piques our interest. I, I don't understand. What does this actually mean? And, and there it is, that sense of mystery has, has come alive. And our heart yearns towards it. We're moved by it. And as a result, we investigate and perhaps even undertake the training because we wish to, we wish to find out more, quite naturally. There's a danger attached, though, <laughs> to this. And there's a, uh, a Zulu story also about a, uh, a covered vessel. In this case, it concerned a farmer who discovered that his cattle uh, were being milked at night secretly and the milk was being stolen away. So one night he stayed up and uh, stood guard 
and in the darkest part of the night, suddenly from the heavens, these ladders came down, and these beautiful heavenly maidens descended, uh, and with their calabashes they began milking his cattle, uh, and he ran at them, uh, shouting, Stop! Stop! Thieves! Thieves! And they all ran to the ladders, the heavenly maidens, and then began climbing up them. But there was one who had strayed just a little bit too far, and he was in between her and the ladder, and so she couldn't get back. And so he caught hold of her. And you know how these things go in the fairy tales. He takes one look at her. She is a heavenly maiden after all. Uh, and he says to her, um, right, you're staying with me and we're getting married. And she looks at him, thinks, well, OK, he seems to be OK, uh, uh, too. Fine, she says, I will marry you. Uh, and we will settle down together and we will have children and as long as we are together uh, we will always be happy we will always be content and have enough to eat and we will be uh, have happy and uh, fulfilling lives but she says there is one stipulation and here we go the one forbidden thing uh, uh, there's one stipulation this is my little calabash and she showed him the good uh, that she had that was had the top now firmly on it she said you must never look inside this calabash and he said oh, okay all right fine so they go back they get married they settle down they have uh, the children uh, and indeed they live a most blissful and harmonious life and the years go by and things settle down and as is the way of things that question about the calabash what's in that calabash it begins to gnaw at him he wants to know but she said that under no circumstances must he look inside but the desire to do so grows in him and eventually it becomes more than he can bear and so one day while she's out he goes over to the calabash which, which has sat on a shelf ever since they moved in together, takes it down on the table, lifts up the top and looks inside. And what does he find? It's empty. And he bursts out laughing. Oh my silly wife. Making all that fuss over not looking in the calabash when all this time there was nothing in it after all. There's nothing, in other words, there's nothing to this mystery. And he bursts out laughing, really uncontrollably, and after a short while, she comes back, and as soon as she walks in, she knows. And she says, oh, you foolish man, what have you done? By looking in that calabash, by taking the top of it, you have allowed our happiness to escape. And with that she collects herself up and the children and off she goes and usually in these stories uh, they end one of two ways either they end there and the happiness is gone for good or uh, the other partner uh, uh, realizes his or sometimes her mistake uh, and begins to set off in search of that happiness and now has to undergo an arduous journey here we are with that arduous journey which we've already made in order to come right back now uh, to where he previously was except now he knows the worth and the value of that mystery and no longer dismisses it as nothing and this is this is something that we are well, we, we, there are two reactions we can have to this mystery. Either we say it's nothing but, in which case we chase it out, but it doesn't go very far before it manifests somewhere else. Now something else piques our interest, and now I must know that. And we play a constant cat and mouse with it. The other th way that it goes is that I create all sorts of strange and weird and fanciful pictures about it and believe all sorts of nonsense uh, uh, about it uh, no matter how much in the face of reason it, it flies there's something between those two that keeps the purity of that mystery that but for that to really happen we have to be able to live in the presence of that mystery but without 
creating all my painting all my pictures and all my explanations about it this is why in Zen uh, so often these things are simply swept away it's not that we're sweeping away the mystery not at all quite the reverse uh, we're opening it up to see it in its living presence rather than exchanging it for handfuls of odd beliefs and uh, peculiar explanations so here we have it that little basket there the brushwood gate is firmly shut and neither sage nor buddha can see him and it is said as has been mentioned before uh, that those people involved in the uh, training a good zen student uh, should leave no traces whatsoever there really is that sense of just uh, uh, whatever we do we come into a place we go into it in that harmony uh, and we keep that harmony we preserve the harmony of the places where we are uh, we do not upset things I do not insist on making my stamp on things uh, and are always having things my way so that when we go like ripples on a pond they smooth out and no one knows that we're there and this is really what it's pointed at there's a lovely um, uh, a verse in the Dhammapada along this uh, when talking about the sage uh, the wise one who the wise one goes about town uh, as the flea collects nectar from the flower without damaging that flower so does the wise one go about the town that brushwood gate is firmly shut and neither sage nor even the buddha can see him why can't the buddha see him buddhas come into existence in order to uh, teach beings who are still subject to suffering that is their reason for being if such a being is so in harmony with things as they are uh, that and therefore no longer suffers from that delusion then uh, well Buddhas cannot see that either they're of no concern to the Buddha he has deeply buried his light and permits himself to differ from the well-established ways of the old masters. And with this sort of sentence we have to be careful. He has deeply buried his light. That means that he's not showing off. And uh, there are all sorts of stories about how that uh, uh, great care must be taken. Because of course that, that great mystery which is the Buddha nature is a tremendous energy. Uh, it's the energy of life and it can be quite dramatic and there's an, a certain uncanniness about it as well uh, that's its mystery it's this is something that's quite pre-human or a human goes back uh, to the very beginning to the source as we had in our last picture there's a story of uh, master robaku in fact who was the uh, teacher of Master Rinzai, the founder of one of the great houses of Zen. Uh, and it's said that once Obaku was on pilgrimage and uh, he stayed in a hostel uh, and also there was a, a, another mendicant, another monk, and they both got to talking and they got on extremely well. So the following day they set out together uh, and as they came along, they, as they walked along they came to a river and the ferry had just set off. There was no bridge and so uh, <coughs> there's nothing else to do as far as Master Obaku was concerned he sat himself down uh, on the bank and waited for the ferry to come back but the other walked to the edge of the river and stepped out onto the water and began walking across on top of the water and part way across the, uh, the monk turned to Obaku and said come on he said why don't you come with me and Obaku shook his head didn't say a word don't be afraid. Of course you can do it. Uh, just step out with me. Obaku again shook his head. Now, if you're worried, he said, I'll hold your hand and we will both go across quite safely. And Obaku again shook his head. So the monk shrugged and continued on his way. And when he got to the other side, he sat himself down and now had to wait for Master Obaku, who came over with the ferry. And when he landed... Um, the monk said to Obaku, Why were you being so difficult? Why wouldn't you just come with me? And Obaku looked at him 
and said, If I had known that you were such a one as this, I would never have taken up company with you. And with that they parted. It may seem pretty rough treatment, really. But there's, we have to be careful with those things. Uh, it's said in the training that uh, sometimes these unusual things can occur and they can very easily be appropriated by I. Uh, and not only do they take the place of training, they, they become something that I rely on, they become something that I also mislead other people using, and can lead others astray. And certainly there are plenty of scandals around very charismatic gurus and very charismatic senseis and so on. Uh, and we have to be careful with those things. He's deeply buried his light, therefore, so you don't see those things showing off, and permits himself to differ from the well-established ways of the old masters. And this is now something else that, particularly in Zen, because there's, there are those stories, aren't they? Master Tanka uh, burns a Buddha image. Master Rinzai says, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. We have to be careful with those things. And we remember the story of Master Hyakujo. Uh, who every month gave a public talk and an old man came to see him after one and said I 500 years ago used to be the incumbent here in this monastery and one day a monk came to me and s asked is a man of the way free from the laws of cause and effect free from the laws of karma and I replied yes he is and as a result of my error and leading him into error with my answer I have been bound into the body of a fox for 500 years. I have now come to the end of that time, and I would like you to say a turning phrase to spring me out of this incarnation, or this series of incarnations. And so Master Hyakujo assented. Immediately the old man said, turned the question on him, Is a man of the way free from the law of cause and effect? And Master Hyakujo replied as quick as a shot, He does not obstruct them. So there's a whole different remit here between going against the precepts, seemingly, uh, and actually not obstructing the laws of cause and effect, because the precepts are about uh, protecting us from the worst excesses of uh, our own uh, <laughs> passions, uh, and also the pas oh, to protect others as well from those excesses, and to make sure that the karmic consequences are, not, are as least harmful as possible. And such a one will work within those circumstances. And when Master Rinzai says, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha, he doesn't now get caught up on those things, uh, on, on such a phrase, and think, right, now everybody will fall back aghast and will think I'm the bee's knees because I can say this sort of thing. Me, the great Master Rinzai. If it's got to that, it's already gone far astray. And yet, we don't have to look far. There are plenty of scandals where these sorts of things have been taken quite literally. He's no longer subject to them, and the reason that he's no longer subject to them is that he's realized his own inner nature. And we remember that the precepts and so forth, although they appear to come from the outside, they originate in our human nature. And if we are truly at one with our humanity, then we no longer need to follow rules. No other species on the planet follows rules or has ethical codes or anything like that don't need them. Why? Because they live out of the choreography of their own souls. They live out of the uh, information, the informing information of their own heart, uh, and they obey it. They uh, uh, have sufficiently laid themselves down. The reason that I don't do that is because it doesn't suit me to do so. This is the only reason that we are not aware of our own nature, uh, because I am attached to my own wants and my own likes, and therefore uh, I am deluded. Carrying a gourd, he enters the marketplace. Twirling his staff, he returns home. So the, here he is with his comings and goings in the ordinary way of things. He frequents wine shops and fish stalls to make drunkards open their eyes and to awaken to themselves. And of course we are the drunkards uh, because one who is drunk doesn't see things clearly. Uh, has uh, their 
consciousness is clouded and that drunkenness is not just the alcohol based one i mean at least if you, even if you do drink uh, a bottle of scotch uh, uh, time will sober us up the problem with the delusion that we suffer from which is the attachment to i is that not only do we not just wake up from it uh, in the following morning we don't even realize we're drunk not unless we're really suffering and then we know that there's something wrong but even then i'm usually blaming someone else so frequenting these wine shops and fish stalls yes he has to go to these places uh, he has to be able to go everywhere uh, because this is th this is where the beings are who need to be saved or, or don't need to be are, are, are in need uh, uh, of liberation and he can offer that helping hand and that's what he does he offers the helping hand he doesn't shove it down people's throat throats actually what he does is he lives out of his own heart out of his own warmth of heart and it's that warmth of heart that attracts like moths to the candle flame only this candle flame will not burn it will warm Master Rinzai, quoting the sutras, explains about the man of the way, saying that such a one can go into the wilderness without being molested by wild animals, can go into fire without being burnt, and can even play in the three deepest hells uh, as if they were a fair ground. And when Venerable Myokyo Ni first heard that, uh, when she was in Japan, uh, she she was rather shocked by that. She thought, you know, it's a shame, even in Zen, there are these overblown examples and the following day uh, master sesso her teacher uh, took that up straight away and said if you read this on the surface it sounds little more than callous you know playing in the three deepest hells here you are literally in the midst of the worst suffering that's possible and to be playing as if they were in a fairground but he said if they got caught if those bodhisattvas themselves get caught up in that suffering then they only add to the sum total of suffering in the world it is because they can play around in them uh, as if they were a fairground uh, that they are in a position to be able to offer a helping hand and if you look at the wheel of life actually you can see on certain wheels of life um, you will see that there's a, in each realm there is a little circle with a little figure standing there that if you look at closely at it quite clearly as a bodhisattva in other words, the bodhisattvas exist in every realm, from the heavenly realms right the way down to the hell realms. And what this is pointing to is, is not that our task is to escape uh, from the highs and lows of life. On the contrary, we go in and we live it as fully as possible. The, the joys and the sadness and the sorrow, we, we're prepared to live that. We're no longer frightened by it. That's what it means when he has his robe wide open. He, he does not resist life at all. In fact, quite the reverse. Uh, he, is, he welcomes it and is able to say yes to it. Even the bitterness, uh, the bitter edge of life that there is. Yet he is not afraid of it. And in the end, neither is he afraid to lay himself down and become returned to that source, that no thing that is there the forms go but that life that life goes on into the new transformations if we're part of that great process and we recognize that that process is our true nature then the forms can come and go and we are not uh, terrified uh, when they begin to decay unlike the gods who are this is why uh, it is said only from the human realm liberation is possible because that wisdom consciousness arises in the human realm. So coming to the end of our journey now, we can see uh, that yes, we have come full circle, uh, but we can also see the journey that we have taken. First, that humanizing process, becoming discovering and developing our humanity. Uh, once that has been achieved, once that has been attained, perhaps is the best, put it better, uh, then there is that kneeling down with the hands together and the ha head, bed, head bent reverentially, because suddenly 
that great power that's symbolized by that mountain and that shining full moon uh, begins to appear returning to the source but not even staying there for long this is the Mahayana and so returning to that marketplace with bliss bestowing hands uh, being of service to others not because I want to and that's not because I want to save beings but because it is the nature of humans uh, to be moved by the plight of, of all beings uh, and therefore to respond in kind okay well uh, that brings us to the end uh, of this series the 10 bull herding pictures <laughs> Yeah, the boy so I can't